The Townsend duties were also withdrawn, but things with between the colonists and the British government had gotten very tense and politically aware colonists begun to be concerned about this incipient tyranny uh, that they perceived was coming at them from the British government. And that fear found real expression in 1770 uh, when there was uh, a group of Bostonians who were protesting or perhaps a mob of Bostonians who were getting out of, getting out of hand and becoming violent, depends on uh, what the witnesses uh, said, but in any event, this, uh, these protesters or mob, whatever, were fired upon uh, by British troops. And several of them were killed, including, including an African-American named Crispus Attucks, who was one of the, the first casualties of the, uh, of the American Revolution. This outraged uh, many colonists, and particularly those in, in Boston and Massachusetts, you know, near where this, uh, this event occurred. And uh, some of the British soldiers who were responsible for this were um, arrested uh, and tried in court. And they were represented um, by none other than John Adams, who was, who was a lawyer and he was a revolutionary to be sure, but he also believed in due process. He also believed that everyone um, deserved to have a trial and that they were presumed to be uh, innocent until proven guilty. And that this applied to everyone. And this gets at an element of the American Revolution that makes it, that sets it apart from, uh, from many other revolutions because this was a, a kind of an orderly uh, revolution. The leaders were men of property who were trying to protect their property from being, you know, in fact, taken away from them one way or the other by, uh, you know, heavy uh, taxation. These were men of stature who believed in law and order because nobody benefited from law and order more than, than they did. And so, and John Adams, so John Adams' commitment to law and order reflected uh, the commitment of other leaders of the, um, of what was now you know, turning into what we, what we would say the American Revolution. They didn't speak of it that way uh, back then, but, you know, but they, they would have implicitly understood that this was beginning to emerge. And indeed, ordinary uh, people were taking to the streets, were joining the protests uh, as well. And you would have thought that the, the property owning you know, elite uh, leaders of the revolution would greet this development um, with applause, with a sense of, you know, now we're really getting somewhere where, you know, people are being mobilized. Well, they were property owners and they were, they were, uh, they were elites. They were, they were not quite aristocrats because you didn't have an aristocracy um, in, uh, in America, but they were getting up there and they were suspicious and concerned about uh, about ordinary people, because these people didn't have the same respect for property. These people didn't necessarily have the same respect for law and order. These people you know, didn't necessarily understand that this was an orderly uh, protest for redress of grievances. And you know, once they got involved politically, who knew where it was going to stop? You know, right now, they were helping to protest against the British government, but down the line, they might protest against um, the uh, the government uh, by their by their betters by the uh, the property owning uh, elite they might protest against the class distinctions um, that uh, were just taken for granted by and large at that particular uh, time. In 1773, the British government did something uh, interesting. Tea was, of course, a, a popular um, beverage in England and also in, uh, in the colonies. And in India, where the tea for uh, the British Empire was grown uh, under the auspices of what's called the East India Company, which functioned almost like uh, a government in, uh, uh, in India, had its own paramilitary forces and so on. The East India Company had a surplus 
of tea that they needed to get rid of. And the, East, the members of the East India Company were well, well connected with members of, of parliament. And so they got uh, parliament to uh, sort of, you know, to, to help them get rid of all of this, uh, uh, this tea. And so what the, uh, what the British parliament did was they passed a tea act. And what was involved with that was it was a revenue producing uh, customs duty. But um, even when you added in the, you know, the customs duty to the cost of the tea, which is very, very inexpensive, the colonists were going to get a bargain. And so you know, that sounded like a good thing. Uh, you know, as far as the British were concerned, you know, surely the, the colonists will be OK with this. Well, by this time, the colonists were getting to be very suspicious of the British government. And so the way that they thought of, of the Tea Act was that it was an attempt to manipulate them. It was an attempt to, um, um, to almost try to claim that, OK, look, if we, you know, if we give them inexpensive tea, we'll soon find out that they value cheap tea more than they value liberty. You know, perception is reality. And by this time, uh, the colonists suspected the motives of the British government. So the, there was practically nothing the British government could do at this point that some colonists were not going to be suspicious of. And colonists were very suspicious of, uh, of this tea act. And uh, at the end of 1773, you have the famous uh, Boston Tea Party, in which uh, Sons of Liberty, as they were called, a, um, uh, an organization vaguely resembling, you might say, the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys, if you want to go uh, in, that, in that direction. Sons of Liberty is what they were known then. They dressed as Native Americans, so you have an act of cultural appropriation. They board a ship that is bringing in uh, the first crates of tea for sale. And they board the ship at night uh, with the intention uh, of taking those crates of tea and throwing them overboard. And yet they brought with them a padlock because they knew that in order to get to the crates of tea, they were going to have to destroy the padlock. You have to break the padlock uh, of the ship's hold, the lock, uh, so that you could get at the crates of tea. And because this was a protest and because at the bottom of, all of these protests, they were protesting against taxation and they were and they were bothered by taxation because it was an encroachment, a threat to property. One of the things that they wanted to underscore was, you know, this is a protest. This is not about vandalism and it's not about looting because one of the things that the, that the Sons of Liberty all agreed was that they were gonna dump the tea into the harbor. They weren't gonna steal any of it. And it said that um, as they, left the ship and were going back to the streets of Boston, uh, they found that you know, one of their members you know, looked as if he were carrying something that he should not have been carrying. And sure enough, he'd been, he stole some of the, the tea. But what they did was they beat him, they stripped him naked and they sent him running off through the streets of Boston uh, alone. Because again, they were protesting, uh, not stealing. Well, the British government didn't really see the distinction. And, um, the following year, once the British government discovered, because it takes three months uh, for communication to go back and forth across the Atlantic each way, three months, one way, three months, the other, and the British government heard about the, this Boston Tea Party and other uh, acts of uh, resistance to the British government. Uh, it passed something called the Boston Port Act, uh, the Administration of Justice Act, the Massachusetts Government Act, co co collectively known as the Coercive acts. And as you see, the Boston Port Act closed the harbor to commerce until the citizens paid for the tea. The Administration of Justice Act allowed the governor to transfer cases to courts outside Massachusetts when the government thought that an impartial trial could not be had within the colony. So, you know, if loyalists or British soldiers, once again, you know, were, were going to be tried in a Massachusetts court, the, uh, it was thought that the government, that the Massachusetts uh, people were not going to give these, uh, these people a fair trial, these loyalists a fair trial. So the idea was the, the world governor had the power to, uh, uh, to send them elsewhere to stand trial. Then the Massachusetts Government Act, which revised the colony's laws 
to increase the world governor's uh, powers. And notice that all of these things affect uh, Massachusetts. In a, in the, not only is Massachusetts sort of the greatest hotbed of protests, it is a locality that the British government you know, target partly to punish them because they're the, you know, they're the culprits and they need to be punished as far as British government is concerned. But partly, at least in the eyes of other colonists, uh, as a way of intimidating the other colonies. Look what we're doing to Massachusetts. We could do the same thing, uh, the same thing to, to you. So, you know, watch yourselves. And then at the same time, the British government passed two other uh, measures that were unrelated, but also antagonized the, uh, the colonists. The first was a new, more extensive quartering act that required colonists to give food and lodging in their homes to British soldiers. Sometimes the British army uh, didn't supply enough barracks for soldiers, and so an expedient way to, uh, uh, to feed and house them was to put them in the lodgings of, uh, you know, of, of, of the colonists. Uh, this was a practice that went on in Europe. It was a practice now that was uh, that was transferred to uh, to the colonies, and um, the quartering was already done at times in the colonies. But now we have a new, more extensive quartering law. The colonists didn't like that, and finally, they didn't like the Quebec Act because it attached the area north of the Ohio River to Canada and gave the whole region an authoritarian and centralized uh, government. And so, take a look at this. What we're talking about is that purple area. Now it, it all becomes Quebec, as far as the uh, the British government is concerned. And what that means is, if the colonists are ever allowed to settle beyond the Appalachian Mountains, they're not going to be able to set up colonial assemblies the way that they have in the 13 colonies east of the Appalachians. They're going to be under a centralized government. Decisions are going to be made for them. And so it's really no wonder that collectively the coercive acts and these two additional laws are known as the intolerable acts. Things begin to move toward a head. Thoughtful people on both sides of the Atlantic looking at uh, the tension of the situation. And from our perspective, looking at how far that downward spiral had carried um, everyone, believed that a military confrontation was possible. And this possibility became more likely when the British sent uh, troops into Boston uh, under a General Thomas Gage you know, with the ability and perhaps the intention of, uh, of bringing the colonists to heel. And the colonists aware that things were moving in this direction. They'd already put together a, a continental Congress where the various colonies you know, met together to discuss what was going on, to coordinate uh, plans of action. Uh, these were just sort of you know, large meetings. They weren't really, uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't in a position of governing uh, yet. But one of the things that came out of, uh, you know, of the first continental Congress was uh, a sense that all the colonies needed to prepare for a military confrontation. And at that point, the colony of Massachusetts reorganized their militia into something called the Minutemen, very famously so. Uh, and it turned out they needed the Minutemen because uh, in early 18, uh, sorry, in early 1775, uh, Thomas Gage took his army outside of Boston on an expedition to uh, capture a magazine, a storage facility for uh, armaments, weapons, ammunition, equipment uh, that, that weapons uh, re require to take that away from, uh, you know, from the colonists. And uh, the Minutemen, so Minutemen met the advancing British column uh, at Lexington, Lexington Green, which was on the way to, uh, to Concord, and then fired the first shots of the, uh, the War for American Independence. It was called you know, the, the shot heard around uh, the world. So, so here, the, uh, the War for American Independence finally begins. The American Revolution turns violent. Now, we've been talking about mostly um, uh, you know, political matters and to some extent, you know, social and economic uh, matters. Where's the military history 
uh, in all of this, you know, you don't seem to get to it until Lexington and Concord, a little bit there in the Boston Massacre, but still not very much military history. Well, no. Because what we can do is think about the Revolutionary War as a people's war. And what I mean by a people's war is in, is in, the, uh, uh, is in the sense of people's war as a theory of war that was created supposedly by Mao Zedong uh, alone, but really Mao Zedong and other, uh, other members of the communist, uh, the communist resistance um, to, uh, uh, to a Japanese rule that they, they found to be um, unacceptable. And during the course of this, of a long struggle to gain power um, within China, Mao and his top, uh, top commanders came up with this idea of uh, people's war with three phases as they thought about it. In the beginning, this theory was that you, you organized and politicized. What this meant was you, there was an oppressor government because this, this idea of people's war was, was designed, was intended to be sort of transferable uh, to other, other countries. You know. So it was, a, it was a sort of a larger theory of, uh, of resistance. You have an oppressor government and that oppressor government you know, initially seems to be you know, powerful and uh, unstoppable and it's certainly overbearing. If you're going to resist that oppressive government and eventually overthrow it, the first thing you have to do is organize. And then you have to add people into your organization and that requires making them aware of, um, of, of their own oppression and, and that there is uh, a sort of an ideology that underpins their, uh, uh, their sense of, uh, of oppression and that gives them uh, the right to, uh, uh, to, to fight back. And then eventually when, uh, when enough people have been politicized and the organization is large enough, then you move to a stage of insurrection and guerrilla warfare. And this is hit and run warfare. The idea is you, you at, the, at the beginning, at the end, end of the organization and politicization phase, you have convinced uh, people that resistance is possible. And the insurrection and guerrilla warfare uh, stage is you begin to resist militarily but you don't have the ability to take on the oppressor government's uh, military forces directly. So the idea uh, that Mao had was of, um, of a flexible kind of back and forth uh, you know, war where you sort of hit them where the, the oppressor government's forces where they weren't, uh, and, then you, you know, and then you got away and you, you sort of hid yourself among the people. You were sort of you know, acquired sort of the moral camouflage of civilians, which would make the oppressor government uh, have difficulty you know, finding you. Um, and you would carry this on, this kind of you know, attrition that uh, uh, eventually, if things went, went well, you know, could lead you to acquire enough support, uh, both internally and perhaps from outside uh, entities that were sympathetic to your cause, that you could move toward conventional uh, war, take on the, uh, the enemy armies head-to-head, uh, uh, -head, toe-to-toe, uh, and eventually gain, uh, gain victory. This three stages were, by the way, designed such that uh, you, weren't, you weren't committed to you know, one, two, three. You go from one to two, and if two doesn't work out, you back up to one. You go from one to two to three. If the conventional war doesn't go back, pan out, you go back to number two, the insurrection uh, and guerrilla warfare. Um, aspect of things. So it's a flexible um, conception. Now, how does this play out in the American colonies? Well, in China and in Vietnam and some other areas, it played out in just this kind of way. The Vietnam War uh, went through these three stages uh, precisely. When the North Vietnamese ultimately captured South Vietnam, they did it in a conventional offensive with tanks and everything. 
But in the United States, in the War for American Independence, this template of people's war um, works in a somewhat different way. What we've seen uh, in this lecture, this road to revolutionary war, is the organization and politicization phase. If you want to use this conception of people's war as a way of analyzing uh, the American Revolution. When the actual fighting begins, phases two and phases three really occur simultaneously. Um, there are, particularly in the South, militias whose main function was to go around and try to intimidate uh, the loyalists, people still loyal to, uh, to the British uh, king. In fact, I have a direct ancestor who enlisted in the uh, in a South Carolina uh, unit in 1775. And then what they did was they marched into the back, back country to, uh, to intimidate the Scotch-Irish settlers who were still loyal uh, to, to the king. Uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, sort of the, the, the military um, background, the military genealogy that I've, I've got. So you have that, you, you have uh, partisans like Francis Marion, also in uh, in South Carolina. In fact, another one of my relatives is supposed to have provided Francis Marion and his policy, his, his partisans, with uh, supplies. It was known as Marion's commissary. Um, so you know that's there's indication that that's that that's that's the case. We like to believe it that way, anyhow. So you have insurrection and guerrilla warfare, and the colonists might have conducted the entire war in that fashion. There were some who thought that they should, but taken on the whole, it was decided that you needed to have a stand-up uh, army capable of fighting the British army on uh, in toe-to-toe -to -toe on an equal basis. And this led to the creation of the Continental Army in June of 1775 with George Washington placed at the head. So next week, or the next, you know, in our next uh, next uh, lecture, we're going to see how the military struggle of the American Revolution uh, plays out. For right now, what I want to do is have you watch this uh, this video. It's maybe a guy named Tom Ritchie, who does you know, really very good videos uh, that help high school students prepare for advanced placement tests. Uh, in European history uh, and in American uh, history. So here is, you know, it says A push, that's uh, advanced placement in US history. And the, the company for whom he's working in this particular uh, instance is called Fiveable. And that's because if you want to get a perfect score uh, in each area of the advanced placement test, a perfect score uh, is, is a five in each one of them. So that's where that comes from. But this is really a, a pretty good, um, depiction of the uh, of the Stamp Act crisis, which is what really touched off uh, the American Revolution. So what I want you to do is watch this, but you've heard about it before, but now I want you to look at it with the idea of a, of a Maoist people's war in mind and think about this as uh, an example of the organization and politicization phase. Hey there students, Tom Ritchie with Fiveable with a little A push review and I want to talk to you specifically about the Stamp Act. Now there are all kinds of events that led to the American Revolution, a long train of abuses and usurpations so to speak as Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence, but more often than anything else as far as the numerous taxes that Parliament put on the colonies, we hear about the Stamp Act. Now of course there are three taxes that an A push student student looking to make a five should know, and those are the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, and the Townsend Acts. And what is it that makes the Stamp Act so much more important than the other two? Now, first of all, the Sugar Act and the Townsend Acts are both import taxes. It's one of those things that while the colonists didn't like those taxes, it's kind of like if your parents took your phone away from you. You wouldn't like that your parents took your phone away from you, but you believe that they have a right to. After all, they pay for it. And so you're not happy about it, but there are things that perhaps your parents could 
punish you with that you think you have no right to do that. That I came in past curfew, you can't tell me to rob a bank. You don't have a right to tell me to rob a bank. That's illegal. And so the Stamp Act being a direct tax is something that the colonists saw as illegal. And what it was is while the Sugar Act before that had put a tax on imported sugar, which was something that, while the colonists didn't like it, Parliament could do it, the Stamp Act was an internal tax on paper products and legal documents, and this was passed by Parliament without the consent of the colonial legislatures. Now, this goes all the way back to the Magna Carta, which had set the principle of taxation by consent, that the colonists saw themselves as English citizens. Now, of course, the English on the mainland didn't really see them that way. They saw them as colonists. By the colonists' reckoning, their legislature should be able to consent to taxes so that their representatives had to say in it. Now, what we need to realize is that the colonists did not want representation in Parliament. After all, when you do the math, if the colonies were represented in Parliament, they'd get outvoted. They wanted their colonial legislature, such as the Virginia House of Burgesses, to be able to consent to this taxation. And since Parliament did not allow the colonists to consent to this taxation through their legislatures, this was an illegal act by Parliament. And this is why the colonists responded with boycotts of British goods and with a bit of mass resistance and mob violence. As far as the boycotts, we need to remember that the role of the colony was first of all to produce raw materials. These raw materials were sent to the mother country country in order to be manufactured into finished goods, which were then sent back to the colonies and the colonists were supposed to purchase those finished goods. So when we see that the Daughters of Liberty were creating this homespun cloth and all of a sudden it's fashionable to wear this homespun cloth instead of a suit that was manufactured in Britain and is all fancy. Now it's kind of like people that go to the thrift store and buy clothes even though they can afford to buy new clothes. It's just fashionable. And so what's happening is that British merchants are petitioning Parliament because they're saying that we're not able to make any money because of what's going on here because of this boycott. Now, of course, there's also the Sons of Liberty and they are doing their thing and intimidating some of these tax collectors with the slogan of no taxation without representation. And then once in a while, maybe a tax collector gets tarred and feathered or something like that. We see this British cartoon is showing the colonists as a lawless mob here. And so occasionally a tax collector would resign and the Sons of Liberty would announce that, well, we have a resignation here and that's because this person was intimidated. The Stamp Act was finally repealed in 1766 and it looks like nobody is going to miss it. Here we have a funeral for the Stamp Act and it looks like this dog's peeing on it. I'm not, was I supposed to say that? That's probably not appropriate and academic context, but I mean, look at him. And remember that while there were three taxes that were passed by Parliament in the 1760s, the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, and the Townsend Acts, that would be great to use as evidence on a DBQ, SAQ, or LEQ, the Stamp Act typically gets the most attention because it was a direct tax passed by Parliament without the consent of colonial legislatures such as the Virginia House of Burgesses, which violated the principle of taxation by consent, which is why the colonists were going around yelling, no taxation without representation. We've got plenty of other great videos. I've got a video on my channel about the road to revolution where I go into all of this stuff in a lot more detail. And also there are plenty of other A-Push review videos here on Fiveables channel. So I would encourage you to subscribe. And remember students, this year is Fiveable. One of the things you do when you're borrowing somebody's videos, you at least let it play out all the way. You know, By the them. colonist standard that their legislatures should... No, I think it's time for you to be quiet. So we'll stop sharing. Okay, it's me again. Uh, I hope that, you know, that having seen this, this short video, um, even though it reinforces things that I've already said, once you, once you hear the same information through the lens of Mao Zedong's 
the organization and politicization phase of, uh, of people's war, you can see why uh, the material that I've just presented to you is worth uh, a lecture because this is the foundation on which the military contest is going to be uh, going to be built. Okay, that's it for now, and I uh, uh, hope that you digest all of this uh, uh, this uh, this well. And then I'll see you next time. Bye.